the the winter school. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Now we are being recorded. Uh, <laughs> and thanks to Laia for for this fan, the fantastic organization of all the logistics and preparations of the of the of the session and the whole uh, winter school. Uh, today is my pleasure to introduce a, a, a very uh, loved colleague here in, in, in Education International Development in the UK, is a world figure and, and a, a, an inspiring uh, academic for all of us, is Professor Elaine Underhelder from UCL Institute of Education. Uh, she's an expert in uh, education, social justice and, and development. And today she's going to talk specifically about uh, questions related to gender uh, equality. Um, we will have like 50 minutes until 11 for her presentation. And after that, we'll, uh, some students will be leading the conversation and the discussion about the readings and the presentation. So Elaine, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Oscar. Thanks for the very nice uh, introduction. Thanks to uh, Tony and Terrace and Laia for um, the, the invitation and the organization. I'm, I'm really interested in this opportunity to um, think about this issue of gender and girls education with you uh, together and walk around the topic. Um, the, the title of the talk is uh, about my own attempt um, at thinking uh, uh, about traveling and translation in uh, relation to a key policy idea uh, that's been around in lots of different forms for hundreds of years, um, the issue of girls' education and gender. But I want to focus on some very contemporary manifestations. Um, later, I'd be happy to discuss some of the historical re reflections with you. Um, but um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm going to focus really on about the last 20 years. And the two perspectives I'm going to compare uh, that I've termed what works and what matters, um, partly what were that they come from terms that have been used by people who have themselves developed these perspectives. So um, let me um, take you to my setup slide. Um, this is um, a kind of collage of moments um, to give you um, uh, little key critical incidents around girls' education at in the contemporary moment. The, um, the extract uh, about girls' education comes from a speech of um, Bob, made by Boris Johnson in um, uh, May 2021 at the time of the G7 um, meeting in Cornwall in the UK. And he, he, Boris Johnson talked and um, we have become accustomed to his rhetoric and the bombastic quality of it. But um, this is a particularly um, difficult uh, extract to um, not feel really angry about. He talks about girls' education as this is the silver bullet. This is the magic potion. This is the panacea. This is the universal cure. This is the Swiss army knife complete with Allen key and screwdriver and everything else that can solve virtually every problem that afflicts humanity. Now, you don't have to be a super uh, acute gender analyst to pull out the kind of violence associated with the cure that gender girls education. It's a Swiss army knife. It's a screwdriver. The, 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 the kind of collection of adjectives around it um, are um, ring alarm bells. 
Um, but a different kind of alarm bell, I think you can see in what, um, when you contrast actions with words. So in the, the, the kind of uh, grid of uh, figures, which is showing, um, it says change in biodiversity, money on global health, it's showing the aid allocation, actually the real amount of money that was they were prepared to pay for something that was considered the, um, the answer to every problem afflicting humanity. Uh, 400,000 um, pounds in aid. So small amounts compared to the amount that was to be spent on health, the amount that was to be spent on economic development. It's, it's a crumb. If you think this is important, put money behind it. But the amount of money put behind it is very, very little. And the um, uh, graph, the bar chart in, in the bottom um, figure shows that actually falling amounts of aid um, to primary education. This is from all donors, not just the UK, which the grid of figures was for. So you see that primary education, which is where the largest numbers of girls who've been out of school need money. There's been a dramatic decline in spending on primary education from donors and a big increase in spending on high, higher education. So the blue bar is the average uh, to 215 to 219, and the gray bar is um, the, uh, the 2020 figure. The last um, just uh, hook I want to give you to uh, orient you to the way girls' education is, um, is featured is the um, uh, uh, little infographic, which was asserting that inequalities in education exacerbated by COVID and this, um, is uh, massively the case in relation to low income countries compared to high income countries. And this infographic came out in uh, 2020. Now, a lot of um, work I did in 2021 was a huge literature review that was commissioned by UNESCO on what we knew about inequalities, gender inequalities linked with COVID. And I trawled through hundreds and hundreds of studies. And there was very, very, very little information on the inequalities are in girls' education and gender inequality in the poorest countries and for the poorest populations. We did get that people did do studies in richer countries and there were very interesting studies done by teachers of their experiences and there were a whole range of surveys. But I want you to contrast the confidence of that um, infographic, the assertions being made about girls' education, the way in which it comes is reduced to numeric form with some of the realities, which is uh, what the photograph is showing and what I'm telling you from my experience as an, uh, of a, as an academic who was working through those studies. So the contrast I want to set up is between girls' education as a policy idea and the range of different ways in which girls' education and gender equality are talked about and um, what kind of comparisons are in play, what happens when the policy travels from one place to another and how it um, different settings translate it into different processes of co-option and disorientation and confusion. Um, I, and on the second slide, what I've done is decode or try to code and analyze using color coding um, 
as a text from the G7 Declaration on Girls' Education that was adopted in May 2021 by the G7 leaders, the leaders of the most powerful countries in the world, um, for whom girls' education and this kind of idea that this crumb was could do something magical and that there the forms of political economic and um, military injustice that um, characterize the world were not their responsibilities but somehow this little crumb of girls education could um, ameliorate these enormous injustices um, the reading of this text I've made, uh, I've drawn some of the ideas from the decolonial feminist um, writings I recommended you look at um, and which I hope you might go back to. Because what I think is evident in this G7 declaration on girls' education is some of these tropes that come from a colonial history uh, in the field of education and international development and that draw on ideas about gender and girls' education in highly problematic ways. Um, what, I, um, what the yellow piece of text is uh, drawing out is how millions of girls are being characterized. And if you read the uh, three or four uh, works on um, white savior feminism and those kinds of ideas that I uh, recommended you look at, these are, there is the sense of essentializing girls in a very um, problematic, um, set of relationships. So they are at risk of dropping out because they may be caring for others, forced into child marriage, subject to female genital mutilation at higher rates, or exposed to increased gender-based violence. So their inequality is associated with a particular set of identities around vulnerability. I don't want to be misunderstood. I am not arguing that these violent misogynistic relationships don't exist. But what I'm wanting to highlight is that this is the only way that girls are being positioned in this text. This is the only way that they're being written about. And the uh, inequality and injustice and vulnerability they force is being linked with um, uh, displacement, sorry, I, I, um, the, uh, uh, let me just, uh, conflict, displacement, and natural disasters. Now, again, it's not that conflict, displacement, and natural disasters are not features of this terrible unequal and unjust world in which we live. But what this text is suggesting is that these are natural processes, that, that human relations and human actions and particular political and economic formations are somehow not implicated in this. But we're talking about the Anthropocene, an age in which natural disasters are not natural. They've been caused by our political and economic relationships as uh, are the major forces of uh, conflict and displacement. And so that we have this notion of vulnerable girls at, for, at, at risk from um, natural forces to which they are to be saved somehow by the, these G7 leaders. And that's, those are highly colonial tropes. Um, when they, although they've set up the problem as conflict displacement and natural disasters, the only crisis they mention is a global learning crisis. So the, the climate crisis, the ec economic crisis, the um, okay, the health crisis around COVID. None of those are featuring as aspects of the crisis. 
And then the solution, what they plan to deliver is portrayed in um, a numeric form and very bland uh, processes. They're going to get 40 million girls into school and 20 million more reading. And then again, they uh, say they will focus on the most marginalized and the most vulnerable, um, most at risk of being left behind. They are the saviors. They're going to decide who they're going to focus on and why. And uh, then once again, the, there's this kind of naturalized invocation um, of what has caused the marginalization, poverty, disability, effects of conflict, displacement, nothing in which the G7 leaders have in any way been implicated. And then um, they say our milestone objectives concern low and lower middle income countries, but they also affect girls in upper middle income countries. Again, there's no statement of responsibility. So the, the setup of the problem is highly, highly um, colonial. It, it, it sets up a problem where they have all the power, they have no responsibility, and people who can speak for themselves are not being allowed to do so. So um, I've taken quite a lot of time and heat to generate what the problem is. I now want to try to turn to contrasting a range of approaches um, that have sought to address this. And I've, 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 I've set these up as two contrasting approaches, um, which has come from my reading of the policy documents. And I'm also making at the end a proposition that um, it comes from a particular uh, kind of social democratic positioning, which you might want to, again, question and critique and it's tentative. Um, the first position I'm, I'm calling What Works, and I take that title because the, the title What Works is the title of numerous policy documents that have come out of very powerful organizations. The, the What Works position I'm classifying as a techno-rationalist approach, it, it identifies particular forms of relationship that, um, that uh, I just, just have to move this to here, um, that uh, about the way in which organizations are organized, the way research is organized, and it understands education systems in a particular way, which I will unpack for you. It also stresses that, um, initiatives, education initiatives are to be scaled up. You go from the small to the large, you experiment, you identify um, the proof of concept. And then you, so you're, it's treating education in a very techno-rationalist way. And comparison is the major form of government. It's the form of, gov uh, sorry, of governance. It's the way in which information is, um, is organized through particular uh, relationships of numbers. And context is highly naturalized or homogenized or othered, a bit like in the way that um, you, saw, you saw me taking apart that text. So it's not that context is not mentioned, but that its specific features of context are identified and the part is taken for the whole. The enormous complexity of social relationships, political relationships, economic relations have become distilled down to a couple of ticks around marginalization or location or income distribution. The and this uh, context is becomes the rationale for saving girls. So um, that they are subject to female genital mutilation or that they um, are in particular the uh, uh, fragile situations. Um, so 
translation, the translation of policy between the global north and the global south, or between um, centers of political authority in a, uh, a, a, a particular country, it's a process of imposition. And you can't um, uh, challenge that imposition because um, of the techno-rationalist um, connections that are made. So uh, I will talk a lot more about what works and illustrate it for you, but that's the position in a nutshell. And I contrast this with the position that I've termed what matters. And I, I, I see what matters as a normatively informed approach to education systems and scaling up. So in the what matters position, which is largely associated and I, um, would like you to look at the UNESCO Education Futures Report from last year, because I think this articulates it. It's the notion that comparison is an exercise of ideal theory. We assert uh, a normative view around equalities or human rights. Um, and there's an I um there's a thought experiment about what should happen. So that, that the comparison is be between the ideal and the thought experiment of the person. And context, that's how you think about contexts. So voice becomes highly significant. And translation is a process of or attention to subaltern languages. It's not uh, this process of imposition. Again, uh, I'm, this might be hard to follow as I'm condensing the position and I'll unpack it a little bit more. And uh, the proposition I'm wanting us to consider, can we develop a perspective on what connects? My reason for doing this is not that I'm uncritical of the um, techno-rationalist position, which I am, uh, but I, I feel that if something matters, we need to make it work. And for those in who position themselves in the techno-rationalist camp, I think if it does work for them, they need to know why and with what consequences. So I'm trying to um, develop this perspective on what connects, and I want to draw out with you what ideas about comparison, translation, context, and community this would entail. And Oscar, I know I'm doing badly on time, so um, I, I'll need to uh, uh, catch up, but let me go on. Um, oh, now why uh, I somehow I'm not getting the slide to move. Let me just see. Oh, Laya, is there a possibility you can move to? Oh, there, thank you. Um, okay, so this is what works. Um, it's associated, um, what, um, what we see and what works um, is, uh, an attempt to stress efficiency and to identify that the education system is complicated, but that many of the complexities of social relations, political and economic relations need to be either managed or somehow kept out in their very, um, uh, the very dynamics of complexity. It only admits certain elements of complexity, not the full kind of ways in which complexity is understood. For the what works position, the learning crisis and the idea that children are in school but learning very little in mathematics or literacy is the key learn organizing idea. And you will evaluate whether your solution works by a limited number of, by, by testing learning outcomes, producing teachers who secure this. And the key um, research method is the um, randomized control trial, which will allow you technically to establishment. Um, the purpose of aid is utterly depoliticized so that aid 
in no way recognizes the unequal relations between the global north and the global south. The idea is that aid is yeah. to um, identify best buys. Yes, yes. Yeah. And um, information systems and information technology is to be documented using um, Inform as used to document what works. And the notion is that if anything matters, it must be measurable. That's um, for, um, a key um, uh, perception that was formulated by McKinsey, who were consultants, who are the groups who are often employed in support of the what works um, position. Um, on, on this slide of different um, examples of um, what works, and I, uh, I, I don't want to talk about them in too much detail because I am aware of how much time I'm taking, but what uh, you see is that powerful global institutions, particularly the World Bank and uh, large uh, research projects like the, the RISE project, which is uh, funded by um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the UK FCDO largely, uh, are very powerful articulators of the what works position. Um, and uh, th this is a bit uh, on uh, how RISE, this uh, research on systems education, uh, uses the idea of context and that context is always to be translated into numbers so that uh, co context is um, identified with a very small number of uh, social relations and then they are developed into numeric form. Um, and again, we can talk about this in more detail in the question and answer issue. And uh, on this slide, what I'm just highlighting is some of the questions um, on, their, on their own terms about the what works position how very inadequate that, that framework is and how little it deals with poverty, inequality and marginalizations, how few of the studies are of that area and how um, the complexity of interventions, aid interventions are so little studied. If we move to the what matters position, what, what we see on, um, or the, this is one I guess I wanted to develop a little bit more, is that at the what matters position, uh, or what I've termed what matters, um, hinges on the articulation of, uh, of normative ideas. They might be human rights, they might be well-being and hum, uh, human flourishing, they might be human development, they might be addressing poverty and inequality, social context, gender equality, or the common good. And uh, the UNESCO Education Futures Report, I think, is the key articulation of this position. In contrast to what worked, which works, which only identifies the learning crisis, in the what matters position, there is an articulation of multiple crises, environmental, economic, expanding inequalities, violence. So it's, it's a broader view. Um, and instead of only selectively identifying bits of context, what the what matters position would look at the complexities of context and in relation to girls education, it would look at the complexities of gender uh, inequalities. There isn't a signature research method, and I think that's one of the reasons that it's politically been difficult for articulators of the what matters position to gain the same degree of um, international purchase on powerful organizations it, because there's a, the, 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 there's a kind of salience of qualitative studies. Qualitative studies are hard to do well and uh, 
hard to do well, they take a long time to do, and they just don't have the same status. Um, there's a notion that scaling up should be reflective, collaborative, um, and to some extent, I think if you, we were to bake the uh, feminist uh, decolonial ideas in, the, 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 some of the major critiques would be part of that. This notion that digital divides are critical and that aspects of what matters are, are unmeasurable and this concern with subaltern voices and the need to translation and seeing translation as a problematic process or that um, uh, translation, you know, raising its own many political issues. Um, on the slide is a range of uh, groups that have been associated with uh, promoting what matters. Um, and uh, it's both liberal, decolonial, and left um, articulators who I see associated with this position. And that you both see UNESCO and you also see the teachers' unions um, in linked with Education International as articulating this position. Some INGOs, although many INGOs have, are much more aligned with the what works position and some local NGOs in South Africa, there's a um, campaigning NGO called Equal Education. I find it hard to identify the Brookings Institute, um, which is why there's a question mark. Um, but there's this very interesting report that they produced in 2016 on scaling up, which is a kind of contrast to the what works view on um, take a small uh, intervention and then scale it up. In, so what you see in this report um, is different approaches to education scaling up that takes seriously the range of different political economic and social relations at different relationships. So I've, I've set up what works and what matters as two different perspectives on girls' education, gender equality, and actually education initiatives generally. So in what works, girls' education will solve every, every other problem, and therefore you'll get girls into school. In What Matters, there's a general perspective on gender equality as linked with human rights and girls' education to be understood in relation to these contexts. And what I want to do in the last um, uh, 20 minutes or so is try to develop this other position that I'm calling What Connects. So this is very tentative. And but what I'm drawing on is a, a notion um, that I've tried to develop from the work of a colleague at the Institute of uh, uh, Education, Jagdish Gandhara, um, which I've called reflexive comparison. And what I'm trying to do in reflexive comparison is draw out positionality, my own positionality, and I would ask you to think about your own positionality, positionality, trying to, but then trying to think, how can we make change happen? How can we critique the kind of global institutions that are highly problematically pushing what works? Um, how can we analyze the forms of power that are associated, political, economic, discursive power that are associated with different positions? And how can we understand uh, and try help to build strategic political alliances so that these two, what works and what matters, uh, each talk to their own audience, but in some way we fail to address the uh, incredible injustices um, that characterize the world in which we live. Um, I, uh, I want the position to be able to engage with critical education policy enactment 
and to take account of racism, the white gaze, the uneven distribution of power. A lot of that has been absolutely rinsed out of how we talk about education and international development as a set of policy ideas or practices. Um, I want us to think about planning in ways that are involve people and how we can protect people and take people uh, seriously in, in thinking about crises. I have seen considerable potential in the system of provision approach, which is this is listed, uh, the, the features of it are um, set out on the slide. The slide is about reflexive comparison. And this slide is about the system of provision approach. And I think I will talk about those in relation to um, questions because it's, uh, it's um, a different way of thinking about education systems. It's, it's, I think it presents analytically a very interesting way of talking back to the education systems approach that's articulated by the what works position. And it's, um, it draws out the, uh, the chaotic features of, um, of systems and uh, highlight their diversity. But again, let's come back to that in the, um, in the questions. I'm concerned through articulating this position on what connects to think about how we can shape institutions for human development. Um, and understand that they might be both reproductive and transformative dynamics in relation to gender inequality, in relation to um, uh, other uh, aspects of equality. And that I want to kind of assert, because this is part of my own autobiography, that there's incredible appeal um, of collective action and collective action that takes seriously us joining together to try to address injustices, thinking about lifelong learning, going with the grade of complexity, and trying to develop research methodologies that have taken normative, critical, and reflexive orientation and use digital. So this is the position. It's I'm offering it for your criticism and a, a reflection. Um, this is an example of what I think um, reflexive comparison might look like in practice. This is a work uh, that some of my colleagues uh, did for the UN Girls Education uh, Initiative. And they developed a whole school approach to preventing school-related gender-based violence and minimum standards and monitoring framework. So you can see that they're using many of the techniques, the techno-rationalist techniques that are linked, that I guess are part of the vocabulary of the what works position. But what they do in the study is they include a multi-dimensional framing of violence, uh, which encompasses forms of everyday school-related gender-based violence, in school, including physical, psychological, and sexual violence, and the intersecting influences of sexual harassment, coercion, bullying. But they also note symbolic and structural forms of violence. So it's saying, Racism is part of the story. Misogyny is part of the story. And that patriarchy, poverty, conflict, climate change, socioeconomic disparities, all of those things have to be addressed. We're not just going to do something in this school about school-related gender-based violence and leave all the other injustices um, unaddressed. So it's... Um, the pro problem as a, is specified in more complicated ways than just low quality education. So I'm, I'm using this uh, Ungai report as an indication that there is space, if we can try to occupy it, to um, transform um, so, uh, so, and connect what matters much more with um, what uh, 
what works. And I think one of the questions you're going to have to ask me is the problem of translation. So in conclusion, oh, I'm, I'm okay in relation to time. Um, what I want to draw out for you is um, the potential of critical reflection on connecting paradigms and communities of practice. Is this just something, uh, will this be derailed because of the existing power direct match dynamics or is this something that has legs? And I think one of the um, crucial issues that I've thought about is that the historical moment might be particularly telling. The historical moment appeared to open up very briefly at the beginning of the pandemic, the COVID crisis. It feels to me as though it's closing again. So the, 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 I think a very alert attention to the um, historical moment and what whether we do have a process uh, opportunities for critical reflection and connecting paradigms or whether that's impossible. Uh, I, I think that's a question. Um, Ages ago, in relation to girls' education and gender equality, I wrote this um, piece on, trans, on, on comparison, translation, and transversal dialogue. And I, in preparing this lecture, I went back to it because one of the um, ideas I developed in that piece, um, which I think is published in Comparative Education, is A, the question that translation may be impossible, that it's not possible to say in one language what means something, what um, is so powerful in another language. The experiences of racial exclusion, genocide, um, utter dispossession and the historical memories of that may be impossible to name uh, so, some languages have words for that and those are languages in um amongst people who've experienced that utter, utter disposition and other languages it's it's just a much more neutral word um so how the words are used raises the question of how the policy is being uh, can the policy even be translated? And I raised in that piece the discussion of um, rather than translation, this process um, that uh, it's uh, been discussed by, by political writers in political theory, but I think it's got potential in relation to thinking about education comparison, transversal dialogue. And what transversal dialogue, um, which is associated with the process that is called by its proponents, rooting and shifting. You need to root where it is you come from. So where is it that I talk from? I talk from a process of um, having been involved with uh, attempts to transform the South African education system and seeing how difficult that is. Having done that first um, as uh, living uh, uh, for a period as, a, as an exile in the UK in the 1990s and then uh, after the end of apartheid, being involved in many of the discussions about trying to sh change the South African education system. So you can see where my kind of social democratic concern with trying to work with the grain comes from, but that I need to listen to people who have been utterly dispossessed, utterly marginalized, so that transversal dialogue is asking you to both root, root yourself, understand where you are, and shift in response to people articulating things that may be unspoken or may be unspeakable, the elements of racism, genocide, dispossession. So that notion of that's a kind of major comment from myself back to the what connects position. 
Um, the third point I want to make in conclusion is about difficult judgments. And one of the issues about girls' education and gender equality in education, and I think you saw that very clearly in the critical comments I made about the G7 declaration, is that the commitments to equality and human rights, they flick on and off. And I think that's been one of the features of neoliberalism and why it's so confusing and why I think the systems of provision approach is a very interesting analytical framing that could um, uh, have uh, uh, cast some illuminating eyes on education and international development as a field of inquiry, is that um, neoliberalism is very good at co-optation. It, it picks up the ideas of um, uh, its opponents and it, it appears to use them. And it's utterly, utterly disorienting. And I think that's been one of the issues about girls' education, gender equality, and women's rights. It's picked up and dropped again, selectively um, uh, in, uh, in causes of um, uh, advancing particular geopolitical concerns or neoliberal economies. And uh, I, I, I've myself referred to that uh, approach. I've called it dispersal, that the ideas are dispersed, the discourse disperses them and a kind of hip hypo hypocrisy ensues. Um, I don't want to end on a completely um, downbeat note, although it's a day in which I think we all feel quite um, grim. Um, I think there's a tremendous amount of analytic purchase about working with the grain of context, taking context as very serious, the context that both affects us, who we are, the uh, methodologies and theories we use and what we cho choose to, how we choose to take them forward trying to be attentive to the modalities of power and the ways in which people seek to divide and disorient uh, movements that seek for justice and um, methodologies and approaches to comparative education, gender equality, girls' education that are concerned with the justices and addressing these, these injustices and think how we can support forms of building solidarity, intellectual, political, and social. And I feel this is, you know, a task that you as new scholars coming into this field have got so much to contribute. So I hand back to you, Oscar, and to students to hear from them. Thanks. Thank you, Ellen. Thanks for the presentation. Um, yeah, um, this, this has been a very stimulating. Um, I think I'm feeling very stimulated. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so maybe Laya, we can start Laya, with the students. Sorry. Yeah, I have a list of links. Ah, bueno. Vale, perfect. Um, I have Zarina, Marisol, Carol, Ariana, Isidora, and Dorothy. <laughs> Have you organized yourself? Do you know who is starting to react to the to the lecture? Yeah, you could. Ah, that's the
I think you are muted, Laia. Okay. Yeah. A ver si llega, es que no sé si va a llegar. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes, we can hear you. Um, uh, okay, so sorry, uh, I will start. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Professor Del Hart and Del Harper for her um, class. I think it was very, very interesting and I've been following her work for some time and I really love it. So thank you uh, for all the insights. And, Sorry, um, sorry to interrupt you. I think you are Marisol. For the voice, I should be able to recognize your voice. Are you Marisol? No, I'm Ariana. No? Ariana, sorry. So introduce yourself and and uh, so we can take note of who was uh, interviewing. Okay. I'm Ariana. I am from Peru. I work in the Department of Education and Research Center at the University of Peru. And I was, I was, I had. Uh, I have many things I want to share, and I think a lot of people will have a question, so I will not take up that much time. And um, what I always wonder is, you know, we focus on the education system and how we are going to make the education system uh, more uh, gender friendly, etc. But then, in the transition to real life and you know the work uh, environment and everything that happens outside of school. There are still um, patriarchal systems operating, and you know how how is it possible? Or how can we actually make uh, a difference or change if we are only if we do not also focus on other systems? You know, besides the education systems, like for example, reproductive rights and the health system and uh, different oppressions that happen within. Mm -hmm. So, I'm just going to yeah. <laughs> Here? Yes. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Again. So, yeah, more or less that, no? And how uh, how this change should, or in, in, in my ignorance, because, uh, you know, I'm not an expert on this, but how important it is also to consider masculinities uh, in this uh, conception of, you know, a, a system that will not be an oppressive system and i one of the 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 articles i think makama's article was also uh, talking about masculinities and how we could um, integrate them or how we should integrate them so that you know that transition and after the school system and everything that happens outside and even inside the classroom no because you know the hidden curriculum also um imprints gender differences so i don't know my, my i think my question is how it, it seems like something huge you know because even when we think about gender and development already that framework recognizes all these things but at the same time it doesn't really meddle with the state because the state also which fosters all of these other systems is a gendered space you know so is there really a way out i don't know um so yeah thank you ariana I, I think it's a a very profound question and um it's uh it, it's it, it's it's i guess it's a question about strategy and tactics um to to use political terms um but uh, these are political uh uh challenges um i i think the what I'm utterly, utterly critical of um, is the uh, what works position in that you identify just one step and you fail to uh, address any of the other unjust relationships that surround it. So you, you will focus on the learning crisis and raising children's reading levels um, and absolutely fail to uh, condemn the kind of unjust, uh, the, the ways in which those low reading levels have been created by relationships of poverty and injustice globally. So uh, the, it is really important to keep the critical frame in place and to intervene in a range of different ways on 
those unjust relationships, but to uh, you can't always be everywhere. I suppose this is one of the challenges to the what connects position. How do you decide on tactics and strategy? And if the strategy is to build more concern with human rights and equalities and build a discourse that at least keeps registering them, not seeing girls' education as something that will let neoliberalism get out of jail free for all the terrible things it's done. That, um, that's the position. So I, I, I'm wanting to keeping arguing for both and. It is both about making a small intervention, which might be in a classroom, it might be in a lecture, it, uh, but and always keeping the bigger picture in view. Have I answered you, Ariana? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ariana. Um, who is next? Isidora, is you? Yeah, I raised my hand, so maybe uh, maybe I can go if no one else wants to from the, okay. Um, so firstly, I wanted to say thank you for a very interesting lecture and uh, for recommending such thought-provoking readings. Um, so I did want to go back to the readings for a second, if possible. Yeah. Um, so as I am a white woman who is a feminist and who is also from a part of the world that's not really super involved in imperialist or colonial ambitions, I'm from Serbia and the Balkans, um, I found myself reflecting a lot on the discourse around the oppressive white woman, particularly while reading the, the texts that were highlighting critiques of white feminism and racism within feminism. And so I was wondering if the dominance of white feminism can be attributed to race alone, or if there are several dimensions that are intertwining to create it. Um, to put it another way, I guess I was wondering about how whiteness interacts with privileged socioeconomic status to create these structures of dominance and suppress solidarity within feminism. And relatedly, given what we know about the intersectionality of feminism and how women are oppressed based on a multitude of intersecting dimensions, including gender and economic status and nationality, ethnicity, race, and loads of other ones, I'm particularly interested to hear your thoughts on the relationship between racism and classism because I tend to think of concepts like neo-imperialism and neo-colonialism in terms of inequalities and oppression within capitalist power relations. And so I'm very interested to know more about how these two dimensions, so racism and classism interact. Um, and my second question that's, it's maybe more just me thinking out loud at this point <laughs> more than a question. Um, and regards utilizing PPPs as an instrument for narrowing the gender inequalities in education, um, I think I kind of struggle with the idea that any intervention that's based on introducing private actors and private interests in education, such as PPPs or voucher schemes, or in fact, any sort of interventions that fail to include uh, a transformative and, and sustainable dimension, meaning they don't really transform the power structures and institutionalized inequalities, but are focused on achieving like gender parity and therefore the MDGs or the SDGs or the G7 goals or any other agendas that are set by the global north. Um, I struggle with the idea that they could actually help achieve gender equality in education. Um, and I think maybe somewhere around there lies my question. Um, does framing the solution as investing in PPPs and private education provision while keeping public education systems perpetually underfunded and therefore creating favorable conditions for further privatization, does it reproduce these existing power structures and inequalities? And can there even be be gender equality within those structures? Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I'm sorry uh, if my questions were really no, Thank you for <laughs> incredibly articulate and uh, incisive questions. Let me start with the PPPs one first. I, I completely agree with you. I can't um, uh, underline enough how um, investing in PPPs that undermine the um, public provision of education and good quality education for everyone feels very um, 
undermining of the, of the kind of um, multi-dimensional human development, um, human rights aspirations. However, there might be circumstances in which such projects might uh, be appropriate. Um, and Afghanistan at the moment might be an example of, of, of that. So it's, it's, a, it's a very kind of frustrating answer in a way I'm going to give you, but, um, but in some way in that every situation has to be assessed. And it has, I think it has to be assessed about the balance of, uh, of forces, the nature of the political moment and the nature of the political actors engaged in whatever education initiative it is. Having said that, I think it's a huge mistake to deny that um, race and class are not part of the story. And I, I, I think the ways in which race and class might be part of the story in relation uh, to Eastern Europe and places with other forms of whiteness also need understanding because it's linked with ethnicity, it's linked with location, it's linked with history. Um, it's not that uh, I mean, the, 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 there's a decades long debate in South Africa on what's called the national question, which is about can you understand the um, uh, so, uh, the social divisions in South Africa purely in terms of class, which um, ha has huge salience. South Africa is one of the most unequal countries, but in the UK, which had a decrease in class inequalities up to the 70s, inequalities have increased massively. So class inequalities, and they have to do both with socioeconomic relationships as well as with sociocultural relations. And race is always part of the story. It doesn't matter if you have a black president of the United States or a black president of South Africa, race is a strand within class inequalities. So the, the complex way, um, so part of, the, as is gender. So we, it's, um, it's like having to keep all these lights flashing in your brain all the time. And every, every critical uh, antenna needs to be out at every moment. And yet we've still got to act. We've still got to use um, our, uh, you know, our skills, our, our education skills, our learning, our capacities to intervene, the authorities um, that we have, and we need to do it humbly. We need to do it knowing that we, you know, he, so much silencing, so much, uh, yes, the terrible atrocities are also being committed. So I, it's a, hard, it's a hard field you're all choosing to join. Incredibly interesting, but uh, you know, everything you've said is correct. And I think keeping all those questions alive is, is also important because silencing is one of the most powerful weapons that is used in um, uh, cementing the injustices. Um, Please come back. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this is um, yeah. Um, I, I'm very thankful to to be able to engage in a discussion like this with you. So thank you. Thank you, Sidora. Who would be next one? Dorothy. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Dorothy, and for, to preface this, I am a Chinese American. I was born and raised in the US. My parents are from China. And I think because of this, I'm very anti this new Cold War that's kind of been happening with the Western powers and with China. And 
I was reflecting on these readings and one of the things that I was really thinking about were these statements about how feminism is often used to push imperialist and like patriarchal like things across the world and how you know these girls in these countries are used as like victims in order to for example start wars and you know get whatever they want out of those countries i think always about that one congresswoman in the us who fully covered herself in the burqa as a reasoning for why we should go to war in the southwest asian north uh, african area and i apologies for my country um <laughs> but um i've been thinking lately about how this there's this very interesting thing that's happening in media and how they are kind of talking about China. And one thing that's really interesting is how it contrasts with the emas historical emasculization of Asian men. So you don't have this thing that happened in the Southwest Asian, North African, Swana area where they were like, okay, the women are the victims and the men are the villains because they spent centuries and decades telling people that Asian men are like feminine and like not scary. So it, it, it's it's strange because they've kind of assigned this role to the entire government, to the CCP, and it ha kind of has kind of taken a masculine role, I would argue. And something that is, I also think is kind of interesting is, for example, you see this recent um, news about the tennis player who accused the vice premier of sexual assault. And of course, you know, this is an issue and Chinese feminists have been on this and they have been like working on this for, decades but none of that is in western media until this happened and i i predicted this like weeks and months ago is that people will never be satisfied until she's like extradited to another country torn away from her country her family like everything she knows that will be the only way that they'll believe her and and i and it frustrates me kind of in that this in this specific context there's this very interesting part where people won't believe anything that comes out of this country not academic papers not like they won't believe anything unless that person has been removed from China. And I think, like, I, I'm just not really a question, <laughs> more of like <laughs> events, but I think it's just how do you argue against people in, in all sorts of like girls' education contexts and stuff who believe so strongly that they are correct and they're doing the right thing and they're like the only people who like really know what's going on, but they don't. The people who live there don't know anything, you know, it's, it's just how? <laughs> how do you argue against this? Because it's just people aren't going to consider the complexities when they don't believe anything besides themselves or what, you know, they want to believe. So that's all. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, Dorothy, thank you. There, there, there are a number of of really important threads that you've you've raised, and I, I think um, together with the point that Isadora raised, I think the 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 issue of the portrayal of Chinese men and the thinking about Chinese women, just like the issue about white other which was a uh, part of uh, of isadora's question i i think those are are very very analytically and politically important things to understand because we we have we have some windows on the problem of the nature of racism because of the uh, important work that's been written by uh, by black feminist scholars from the us and the uk uh, france as well um, but we need we need much more, which is part of this as an uh, invitation to you and Isadora and and others who have uh, who can widen our perspective to to understand these processes because I think the issue you're raising about the uh, the tropes of uh, in relation to the Oriental man the Orient or Orient so there are many layers that still need documenting and the ways in which um, Chinese women are portrayed in Western media and the way in which this um, builds up the um, aspects of the discourse. All of that needs um, 
documenting. I think one of the issues about the systems of provision that I didn't uh, go into in too much detail because I was worried about time, but I, I do find it a very interesting and um, illuminating framework for understanding uh, these, ne the, these aspects of neoliberalism is that it's chaotic and the bits don't fit together. Um, so that you, you can have tropes saying one thing in one place and one thing in another place, which is uh, your example um, about China identifies. Um, uh, uh, and that race, ra racism has many different features in, in, in different places, uh, all of which is an invitation to um, close documentation, close critical examination, and um, expanding the frame of, of, of analysis, I, I, I think. Uh, so I'm, I'm, again, as, as I was responding to Isadora, it's an invitation to you to write, write a lot more down. Think, think about the, the power play that is here and, um, and formalize it because making the, uh, making, uh, I think it's important that ideas start through these dialogues between us. Um, but there's tremendous uh, analytic acuity that you can build through writing it down and circulating it and um, engaging in a, a more formal academic discourse because um, that, th that rigor helps us build the ideas. So again, it's, I, I can only... Uh, open the door for you. <laughs> um, you've and um, thank you for alerting us to it. Uh, I think the geopolitics of the present moment. You know, we're we're all um, holding our breath and and looking at 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 at, 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 at what's going to happen. Uh, and it, it 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 does require a huge amount of acuity. Uh, amongst us as an academic community, uh, as much as us as citizens of a very, very difficult world. Well, thanks for the questions and comments, uh, uh, Dorothy. I, I think it's, uh, it's you, Marisol, that wanted to speak. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me properly? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thank you so much for like I really enjoyed the the readings, all the like the arguments, and particularly in this lecture, like I I think uh, how you uh, frame the differences between what works and what matters is like very much of my interest. Uh, because I wanted to share more like a reflection that I've been having while I've been doing my my research and also while I was reading that is the question uh, that you mentioned about what is education actually for and about because like particularly in this discourse about education as salvation and education as the silver bullet and etc like and it's it's something I also worked I I think in Oscar's um, paper when when like my subject is prison education so I feel in education particularly at a state level and international level one has to deal a lot with the normative which is like what can justify any educational project and what actually education is uh, causing and what people who are leaving education either as a student or as a teacher as a family and like more broadly are actually getting from it so in my particular field um, education in prisons is very much justified like either from a human capital uh, theory perspective because you have to prepare these people for jobs or from like a human rights perspective because it's a right you no know? 
in the in the case of gender uh, in my research like i've been finding like talking with teachers who teach in both female and male prisons that of course there are a lot of less female prisoners but every like all the structure uh, sexism and violence that happen outside of prison replicate in prisons like in a hardest way because female prisoners suffer a lot of abandonment from their families uh, opposite to male prisoners who usually like still get uh, are taken care of by their family members or mothers or wives and it's not the case like females are very much abandoned and also they have the thing that they have their children in prison like at least in mexico until children are like six years old and then they go to housing or other family members which is also like a cause of depression so briefly summarizing uh like in like let's say like studies know that females in prison suffer like a lot of other things that men don't go through, even if, of course, men in prisons go through a lot of stuff. And particularly talking about education, what I have gotten in my research is that a lot of teachers uh, who, of course, care about uh, education for both female and men, uh, say they cannot, like, they couldn't keep teaching, some of them couldn't keep teaching in, in prisons for female, because it was so harsh that they weren't able to even deal with it. And that's like something that's even harder because they, they are aware of how hard it is for them. But there's a point where for their own mental health, they weren't prepared to do the job. So you can see how it's not even about like, like you can see how one thing leads to the other, like as a domino effect. And my reflection on this is that even if you have to justify on the outside that education is for providing these women with opportunities because blah, 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 because women uh, no, receive less opportunities for education and for jobs and like that's a justification but in real terms uh, what I think happens like in the day to day is that for them is like escape no for like escape from their harsh reality and that's like something we, we have been speaking like well the the my interview is and me like about like what these women have shared with them about why they study and like sometimes like it's not even about that and the other thing is that when they describe how women are men study in prisons like you like they say women are super like they keep an order they do all the homeworks blah 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 and they get good grades and male the opposite but in the face-to-face -face, uh like socialization uh women are super shy and depressed like they are not very motivated and men are so that's what was like all these things i was thinking like you know if you would measure education but by what and if you would think the purpose of education in what terms and a bit of like more than a question i wanted to know if if you have also like this dilemma about like sometimes you have to justify education like i know if i wanted to make a case out of prison education i would have to adopt certain discourses which i don't really believe in because i don't think education is for getting i think education can get you a job but i think in this context it's more about survival and finding a, a motivation for staying alive but i know i have to constantly you know, be moving in discourses uh, to make a point of a, a subject that is by itself important without having to prove that it's important. And in the case of women, I think that's even more evident. So I, I just would like to listen to your thoughts on that. And thank you so much. Well, thanks for an incredibly powerful um, contribution and very... Um, uh, resonance examples of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a real life situation and real um, 
challenges in uh, personally, pedagogically, and uh, systemically. I mean, in a way, I feel that you've answered yourself because what you illustrated so powerfully was for me um, the both and situation, both and, 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 because education, I guess, is for all the, um, uh, it's, it's for a very wide range of um, uh, processes and it will need to be assessed differently for different people at different moments. I, I also think that one of the things your example illustrated for me is one of the um, problematic, uh, I mean, you, you were making the criticism implicitly, but I want to just highlight it. Some of the problematic uh, tropes of the what works position, A, that education is for an individual or that it's for a system, but somehow the web of social relations, the family relations, the pedagogic relations, the relations between teachers, those things in the what works position are, um, uh, Lant Pritchard writes about these things, they need to be aligned. They just need to be aligned up uh, mechanically. But what your example highlights is that these are, are rich and highly um, resonant in many, many different directions and very personal. They call on the personal, the social, the emotive, and all of that is important. And the kinds of education that I think we, 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 we dream about and we would like to cultivate in the communities we can work with. And I know this is not easy for us because I just kept trying to connect with you through the screen and, um, but it, it's got something of that personal richness. It, it says these are rich human relations that we, we value and we want to protect and we want to advance. Um, I, 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 I uh, wrote a piece a few years ago, which um, is on prison islands. There are two versions of it, actually. And, and I mean, it, it's both about prison uh, education in some ways, but it's also about the kind of visions of um, political visions that are fostered in these places that are um, reviled, you know, there. Uh, so to some extent those, that experience of education in prison is about terrible loss, the terrible loss of family, the terrible loss of connection. And you use the word abandonment, which is such a powerful one. There also could be places um, where people could try to build solidarities. And I think, uh, yeah. To, to think in solidarity with people who have all that very extreme suffering is, is, is very important. So again, I'm, I'm, I can't, I'm not answering, I'm just in a way uh, responding you know, with very great feeling to the, um, the example you've given and hope that some of the ideas I'm sharing with you all are helpful for you in uh, the work you're you're doing, which sounds incredibly important and deeply felt, and you know, will probably be something that you'll work with for for decades. So, yeah. Thank I'm you. Sorry, so I'm not in the classroom with you <laughs> directly. <laughs> Thank you, Marisol. Um, um, I remember a talk that you gave Elaine in Glasgow about prison education and the optimism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, yeah. So yeah, there are, Marisol, some very uh, 
interesting examples of, uh, of prison islands and the education projects on prison islands. And I know it's different because those accounts are of political prisoners, but there are also issues about um, other kinds of prisoners. And in many countries, I mean, the US is the one that's so written about how if a young, young black men are as likely or um, may go to prison as much as they go to higher education. It's, it's racism is very much part of how we think about, you know, prisons are social institutions and they're implicated with the inequalities of the society. Um, Sarina, Carol, you appear on the same screen. Hi, I'm Zarina. Um, I'm from the Philippines. I have two kind of reflections slash thinking aloud thoughts. Um, the first one has to do with um, kind of my exposure to feminism has always been, not always, but was one of animosity, where it's like you're either one or the other, right? So if you're, I don't know, like against prostitution or for prostitution, you can be branded as both anti-feminist or like if you don't support divorce or like reproductive rights you you are also like either branded as feminist or anti-feminist um and so my kind of reflection or thinking aloud was just also how like we kind of unite these very different or very varying perspectives about who can support the feminist movement, I don't know if that makes sense, but like how you can support it or who can support it and kind of to what extent can you say, oh, like it's okay if you just think of it this way or it's okay that you don't fully support this specific issue because, you know, that's that's your context or that's, that's your culture or whatever. Um, and it kind of goes back to like how also we're kind of, or how the education system allows us to think about these issues for ourselves. Um, obviously, there are dominant discourses, right? Um, and for the longest time, there's always like one of the like earliest kind of discussions or conversations that I have listened to with regards feminism is about whether, you know, like women stay at home versus women in the workplace. Um, and so I was also wondering like, in terms of education, like how, how we're actually teaching girls or even not just girls, right? But like all students in general about like, you know, how, where is there like a middle point to kind of being a part of these discussions? Um, so that's one. And so I don't know if there's really like an answer to that. Um, the second one is related to also what I'm studying now for my thesis. Um, so my, my, my research is on female teachers with disabilities in the Philippines. Um, and so, so in the Philippines, or I think maybe in the world in general, there are more female teachers um, and teaching has always been kind of associated as a female profession. Um, but what has been surprising for me also is that when I did my interviews, um, most if not all of the teachers that I talked to have said that even though there's there are more female teachers and even like more female teachers with disabilities. Um, the kind of environment for them is still more dangerous than it is for men. And there are still more opportunities accorded to men than um, women teachers with disabilities. Um, and so my question is more like, I was wondering if, if you knew of like any spaces also um, in which women or you know persons with disabilities have been given the space um in the kind of in the feminist or in the in the gender equality um movement um that's all thank you uh thanks very much i mean i i, I think you you raise a very profound question which i skated over and didn't talk about in my talk, um, which is the divisions within feminism. 
and uh, those the, the 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 readings I gave you articulated some of those in relation to race and location. Um, but what's also been an incredibly um, sharp point of division in uh, the UK and uh, to some extent in Canada and less so in other European countries, but maybe starting to is the issue uh, is it's almost it's a generational issue and it's an issue uh, uh, around how uh, whether gender identity can be uh, uh, shifted or whether it's biological and uh, the the, the um, it's a division between what a group that's called gender critical who believes that gender is um, biological and can't be changed um, except under very limited circumstances for uh, uh, trans individuals and those who have a, a more expansive view about trans identity and uh, gender identities. And to some extent, that's a very, very profound um, generational as well as uh, political division. Um, and at the moment on that debate, actually much more than the debate around prostitution, where there's been some kind of accommodation and uh, there's very, very profound differences. So almost a middle point doesn't feel possible. I mean, people like me are trying to say, how can we try to build a middle point or a, some process of articulation where the two sides can talk to each other without completely silencing each other. I, I think it's that, that's very difficult. And I, I think you're absolutely correct to articulate that or to alert us to the fact that uh, solidarity is, 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 is not simple it's um and particularly about areas that are highly contested class is an uh, a class uh, it took <laughs> it took decades and it's still continuing to take decades for race to be accepted as an or, or for people to accept that race was an important area to talk about in relation to global inequalities um, but these other complex areas where people disagree, um, that, that has to be registered. It has to be registered. We have to document it. We have to try to understand it. Um, I think the issue about female teachers with disabilities is a more familiar kind of issue. So the continuation of um, patriarchal processes of uh, authority, employment, um, uh, articulation, the, those have been documented for a long time. And I think female teachers with disabilities might be subject, to, you know, there's a, there is a literature that looks at intersectionality in relation to disability and how the disability movement that talked about disability rights itself didn't talk about intersectional injustices in those um, uh, processes linked with so race and gender and ethnicity. So I, I think on the area of your work, you will find I think through intersectional analysis, useful perspectives. I think the, the question about the disagreement on different aspects of feminism and different uh, positions, I'm for now I'm not so um, confident we will find a middle point, but I remain you know, hopeful that we will be able to think how the two positions can articulate, but I think it's going to be down, down the line.
quite a, a lot more thinking and discussion has to take place. It's it's at the moment there's very very sharp division in the UK on that issue. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Sarina. Carol, do you want to speak now? Yes, I can speak now. Hello, uh, Professor Untahota. Thank you so much uh, for the great uh, presentation. I'm Carol. I'm from Zimbabwe. Um, when I was uh, reading uh, the recommended readings, I was just reflecting on the two different perspectives of feminism, which is the African feminism and the Western feminism. Uh, my question was like, as an African black person, I have my own ways of understanding feminism, which is the day-to-day -day challenges I face as a black woman in Africa. And then there are those black women in the diaspora. And then we talk about women in the Northern part of Africa with uh, Arab origins, right? So I was thinking, how do we join these uh, two perspectives on feminism, Black African feminism and white uh, feminism? I was trying to think like, is there a way they can come together and uh, speak with one voice? Uh, without ignoring the experiences of a black African woman uh, who has gone through a lot through the historical in injustices of slavery and colonialism. How can these two groups of people come together and speak with one voice? That is my first question. And my second question is, um, I come from Zimbabwe and uh, I know it's the role of the state to educate its citizens and we are talking about education for girls and we see in, in national policies we're trying to push the agenda of getting girls into schools, international organizations, NGOs and all those philanthropic organizations working together to get girls into schools. But um, um, in, in my country, uh, the president of the country, you can imagine the president of the country from the ruling party from ZANU-PF, during elections, he goes to this province where there's a religious sect called the Apostol Apostolic Sect, and these are a, a, they contribute to a great percentage of the Zimbabwean population. And this religious sect uh, violates girls' rights, and many girls, they enter early into, into marriage. There's child marriages that is promoted by this religious sect. But we see the president campaigning and doing a rally, going to that province and like vote buying, doing vote buying to get votes from these people. At the same time, these are the same people who are violating girls, who are preventing girls from getting into schools. So I was just thinking like, what can be done when as a nation, you're, of course you're doing projects, getting girls in school at the same time, you're also working against that. Um, thanks very much, Carol. I, I, I think the example you give of Zimbabwe, um, um, Ray, uh, you know, calls to mind for me the example um, that I was trying to unpick about uh, the British government. Uh, so who promote has, you know, has a distinctive position in the aid community through, uh, uh, it has this large program, Girls Education Challenge, which is in um, Zimbabwe as well as other countries. And yet our prime minister, you know, he is, uh, has made some of the most outrageous racist comments uh, about black women. He is a, um, in his own personal um, uh, biography, his behavior is not exemplary to say the least. And the policies of this government are associated at the moment with uh, huge um, uh, reduction 
in the capacity of uh, poor women to feed their families and um, support people through very large cost of living increases, as well as massive cuts to all the provision, local authority provision uh, for support against violence against women. So that level of hypocrisy around girls' education that you've given us such a graphic example for Zimbabwe about, I think we could see that in many countries. And that's that kind of framework of analysis that I've tried to term dispersal, that where um, you disperse the meaning of girls' education so that it loses any integrated link with gender equality or uh, transforming unjust structures, and it becomes just this um, uh, rhetorical device by which, in a way, you disguise all the other um, uh, despicable things you you might be doing. So that, uh, sadly, that process is not unique to Zimbabwe, but the way in which it's happening in Zimbabwe, again, requires careful documentation because you've got that deep knowledge of, of, of the layers of the significance and the resonance of, of what's um, happening. In relation to your bigger pro, pro question about how um, feminist movements or black women's movements might speak with one voice. Um, I think there's some issues on which people might speak with what one voice, but on, on what other issues we might need to have a range of different voices because we need to amplify the voices of people who might be suffering very different, well, different kinds of injustices, different forms of misogyny, different kinds of violence for different reasons in different places. Um, the, the, in English, there's this word articulation, which means two things. Uh, a joint articulates, you know, your whatever, my thumb articulates with a joint in my hand. Um, so two things, so the, that meaning is connect, but articulate in English also means to speak out. And it could be that we need not just one voice, we need to work with those two levels of the meaning of articulation. Uh, so we need might need to articulate different kinds of struggles because the points that um, Isadora and uh, Ariana were making were also about very different kinds of feminist movements, just as you're identifying different kinds of feminist movements. And it could be that we need an articulation of those feminist movements that works together, but also allows different movements in different places to speak out about different injustices and that the education processes or ways in which education is invoked into those different forms of articulation um, is also recognized. It might be different in different places for different reasons. Um, I hope that makes sense, Carol. Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. Thanks, Carol and Elaine. We, we have uh, 10 minutes left before the picnic. You're very welcome, Farista. Please go on. Thank you. It's really amazing to see you all uh, here on the screen. And thank you so much, Professor, for the thought provoking and enriching session. And I think uh, like I uh, want to share the challenges that I go or like I think about and I go through on daily basis as an Afghan woman. I'm from Afghanistan. Uh, one of the questions that I have is that, is it even worth building alliances with the Taliban who have constantly violated women's rights, who have constantly tortured women for what they are asking is only their basic and fundamental rights, right to education, right to work and right to feed freedom. And like, if that is not the solution that, what, what can be the solution? And 
what is my responsibility as, a, as an educator, as a scholar, or as the people who are living in exile? Like what is what can be their responsibility or their contribution? And uh, what measures should we take uh, as a collective um, collective action to address this injustice, this massive injustice happening in Afghanistan uh, and of course many uh, other countries around the world. And like, how do we empower these women in the country who are suffering not only by the Taliban, but many other people who are having Taliban mentality, even not only in Afghanistan, but outside who are trying to silence the voices of these, like these uh, powerful women or courageous women. Uh, and of course, that feeling of like being abandoned by the international community. What is what is the role of the international organizations who are mainly saying that like they are there to talk about the uh, women's right, advocate for their right, but meanwhile we don't really see any profound uh, uh, action being taken by them to support. Um, like Afghan women or many other uh, people who feel abandoned. So these are some of the questions that I wanted to share. And of course, would love to hear some of your insights. Thank you. Farishta, thank you for that. And uh, you know, of, of the terrible things that have happened in the last few years, you know, the, the, the scenes in Afghanistan are, are so deeply, deeply distressing and the continuation of that situation. And I, I think that, again, you use that word abandonment, which is uh, such a profound word. Um, I think being in exile is terrible because, and I speak as someone who's had that experience myself and uh, this kind of terrible loss that sort of never leaves you. It was written about by Edward Said very profoundly. And um, yeah, he, I think he articulated it and he lived something about that, um, that sense of an, an incredible rift and an incredible responsibility. So what you're doing at the moment, talking up, finding us, you know, the, the world's eyes are on Ukraine today. Nobody, uh, I don't think there's a single newspaper article uh, today about Afghanistan. But that, that's one of the things in exile you can do is make us never forget the, the, these incredible injustices. The, the, there are voices you can amplify. Um, and I guess you can remind us of uh, some of um, the, the injustices and how, what they require of us. You know, they, they require things on different levels from us at different, uh, as educators, as um, citizens, as uh, people who contribute to conversations in a range of ways. And that uh, the injustice, uh, you know, a number of people who've made points today have spoken about very specific examples. The specific is such a powerful exemplar and, to, 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 to document it with the richness of the skills and the voice you have, that's important. And then to, to build methods and ways in which people can use your insights to understand their own circumstances, even though they're difficult. So again, I can only, you know, pass it to you and thank you for for raising it and you know say that education and voice these are injustices we mustn't forget and we mustn't stop trying to change them so thank you thanks Barista. um we have a few minutes uh, left in, in case someone else wants to say something.
We cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so sorry for hopping in at last, but I couldn't help but uh, share. So um, I'm Nimra, I'm from Pakistan, and I want to talk about how uh, there have been many conversations around girls' education programs, the way they're problematized and manifested, but there's very little conversation on what these programs leave behind. So I can take an example of, say, a cash program by World Bank in Pakistan, one of the many cash programs that they have in Pakistan, where uh, which are deeply rooted in these disgusting economic logics that poor people will accept money and that's how we'll increase enrollment. And that's how it works because they do accept money and that feeds into more enrollment. So I think in a couple of three years, this one project increased enrollment of girls from I think nine to 21%. And these are things that World Bank documents. This is, these are things that create all the more prerogative for these programs to further develop. Now, what, what's not documented is are certain cases in which women were beaten up and subjected to violence by many patriarchs for accepting the money because it's culturally and religiously not honorable for them to do that. Now, these are realities that are not documented. These are not things that the World Bank talks about. Of course, I don't need this literature to believe these realities because I've grown up around these, but there are many people who haven't. And these are things that need to be documented and exposed because these are very gross implications that these programs are designed around and not taken, uh, and these sensitivities are not taken into account. So the very idea is that, um, I don't know. I mean, all of these projects that invest so much money and resources into help helping emancipating women, if that results into further oppression of them, um, I don't find anything more paradoxical and disturbing than that. They're just a comment. <laughs> Nimra, thank you for the comments. And I think like Farishta, like, you know, like so many of the comments, it's it's the documentation, it's the amplification of those voices. I hadn't, you know, I have um, read so that there's a huge literature on cash transfers and a lot uh, of um, uh, um, celebration of what is um, achieved through them. So this is the first I've heard of those examples and it's a huge uh, uh, shock for me to hear it and so important. So again, so, so important that all of you in this room use your skills to document these things that are, are not known and uh, to connect, um, allow people to talk because, uh, you know, to. Uh, it's a problem when only one story is told and only one voice is uh, the voice in which um, policy, you know, to return to the major theme, which was about translation. If we, if the, if the only language is English, and it's so ironic that we've had to communicate this in English, so much is lost. So um, we need so many languages and the capacity to understand them in, um, respectful ways and in ways that recognize the injustice and I wish to change it. Well, uh, thanks, thanks to the whole group for, for creating this environment despite being on, on screens and most of us not being uh, close, being able to see each other in, in, in the eye. But uh, it has been great all your contribution guys and Elaine also you for contributing to this. So this is lucky. Yeah. Now we take a break and, and we resume in, in two hours time. Elaine, thank you so much. We will be in touch. I will write to you. Thanks, thank you so much thanks for everything, so much. accepting to be with us. No, thank you. Thanks to all of everyone for wonderful contributions. Thanks, us. Thank you, Elaine. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.